Hey, it's Jordan with 2IT, 2IT Politics, and I'm here with Glenn Greenwald, uh, founder, co-founder of The Intercept. And uh, what a great report uh, today. It's kind of emblematic of everything that's wrong with the media. Um, you, uh, through continual reporting, have found uh, new revelations uh, in the Edward Snowden um, story. Uh, really not n new revelations. It dates back to his original uh arrival in Hong Kong, and you've very clearly debunked false reporting that's dogged this story for years. Can you kind of talk about uh, what you found? Sure, and it is interesting because it does pertain to this one specific case where a obvious lie got spread throughout the entire media. But I think it is emblematic, as you suggested, of broader trends in terms of our political culture and media and how misinformation is disseminated so easily and authoritatively by the most mainstream outlets. Basically, what happened was um, there's a group of journalists and former members of the intelligence community who are now pundits who have been devoted for many years to proving that Edward Snowden is not what he claims, that he's not a whistleblower or someone who acted out of conscience, but instead is somebody who acted as an agent. First, they claimed of China when he was in Hong Kong, and then when he moved to Moscow, they just sort of seamlessly shifted their theory and said, well, maybe he's not a Chinese spy, but he looks like he's a Russian spy. And some kept saying, well, maybe he's bald. Maybe it was, it was a joint uh, Russian-Chinese operation. And the linchpin of this theory was that Snowden's story was that he went from Honolulu to Hong Kong on May 20th in order to wait for us to get there so that he could give us the documents to start working with us. And he said as soon as he got to Hong Kong, he went to the Mira Hotel and stayed there until we arrived on June 2nd and worked with us at the Mira for eight days until June 10th when he finally checked out because of the publicity surrounding the fact that we had identified him. And what they claim is that he's lying, that he actually never checked into the Mira Hotel until June 1st, which means that there's this what they call missing 11 days from May 20th when he got to Hong Kong to June 1st when they claim that he checked into that, the Mira and they've used this just not only to pick Snowden as a liar, like why is he lying? He wasn't really in the mirror from May 20th to June 1st. He was somewhere else. But because they imply that it was something sinister, like these missing 11 days, he was using this to meet with his Russian and Chinese handlers to prepare himself for this act of espionage he was about to do in meeting us. They've used it to build this whole case that he's actually a spy engaged in espionage, not a whistleblower engaged in an act of conscience. And I have had to sit here for three years watching them say this, one media outlet after the next, after the next, laundering it, knowing that it's an absolute lie. But we couldn't get the documents from the Mira Hotel because they didn't really want to be involved. Um, they would just wouldn't give it to us. And it wasn't really worth it until two months ago when one of these um, conspiracists, Edward J. Epstein, who's a longtime writer for the Wall Street Journal editorial page, wrote a book making the case basically that without having the courage to say it outright that Snowden was a Russian spy all along. And the linchpin of this story was that Snowden wasn't in the mirror until June 1st. And so there are the, these 11 missing days in China and Hong Kong. So we finally decided that we were going to do everything possible to get the documents. We got the documents just recently. I was able to write a long story, not only showing the documents and showing that everything Snowden said was true, but how far and pervasively this lie had spread in mainstream media outlets like Slate and Yahoo News um, and Business Insider and through NSA officials like Michael Hayden and John Schindler, who tweets um, in a very popular way for liberals now under the 20 committee handle, just people lying about it over and over and over and over again. And, you know, I just have to say that if you're someone who does media criticism, and most of us hate the U.S. media, as polls show, I know you do a lot of media criticism, I've always done it, it's really frustrating to watch the media report things that you believe are untrue or deceitful or misleading. But when you're actually personally involved in a story that the media is talking about extensively, as is the case for me over these years with the Snowden story, it's hard for me to state and express to people how often that happens, where even the media outlets that you trust use these really smug, certain tones of authority to say things that you personally know are, because you witnessed them or you were personally involved are just lies, are totally false. 
And it really makes you realize in this visceral way just how unreliable and propagandistic and deceitful these media outlets are. And I honestly don't even expect that any of them are going to retract this story, even though we've now presented definitive evidence that they're false. Charlie Savage of the New York Times has been attacking the author of that book, Edward J. Epstein, for weeks now, um, showing that there's no basis for the claim. That didn't move them. I doubt this will move them because they they don't care. They have no journalistic integrity um, the, there's not going to be any accountability for the editors and the reporters who deceive their readers by lying to them outright about this critical matter. And even now that the evidence is available, I'd be surprised if any of them even attach a lazy note at the bottom of these two-year-old stories admitting that they were wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think it just illustrates the reason why you have a lot of people that watch your show and we have a lot of people who read our site is because people have concluded that media outlets can't be trusted. And all this talk about why are people open to fake news and why do they hate the media and the, in a way that Trump can rile them up. This is why. They know that this is what media outlets do, obviously in this story, but also more broadly, especially when it comes to Russia, especially when it comes to official enemies of the U.S. like, like Russia or Edward Snowden. And this is just such a classic case because we happen to be able to get documents that proved it mathematically mm -hmm. that they were lying. And before I move on to the next question, I should add that if for those conspiracy theorists who then want to say, oh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, these aren't real documents, you, you forged them. The New York Times, Charlie Savage, has also independently uh, confirmed your original reporting uh, that this is true. Um, I want to I want to move on because I think it's so important to stress this Wall Street Journal uh, reporter literally wrote a book that this was the central tenant, this missing 11 days theory. I, I've read stories now uh, in researching this, you know, the top five uh, questions around Edward Snowden, and this was one or two uh, in Yahoo and MSNBC's Joy Reid and uh, all these people that it's striking. You kind of see similarities, the same folks in this story, kind of similar stuff you see on Twitter to all this pushing of, Russian hacking and things like that that you and I have been uh, responding to for uh, months. I want to ask you in general, do you think that uh, this is just honest, uh, you know, careless, reckless journalism? Or do you think people like Epstein at the Wall Street Journal, it's, it's, it's a business incentive. They're carving a niche and they're kind of tapping in journalism methods be damned um, to kind of stoke up people's fears. I think it's a lot of those things. I think it's difficult when we talk about motives to try and single one out as the motive, especially when you're talking about multiple groups of, of people. I think we have trouble discerning our own motives a lot of the time. I think discerning other people's motives is, is almost impossible. But I, I think that what matters is the incentive scheme that you've just described. And, you know, I've seen this over and over where one of the worst outlets, the most irresponsible and reckless outlets for reporting on Russia has been the Washington Post. They've done some good reporting over the last year, um, like David Fahrenthal's investigation into Trump's charitable activities, non-existent activities, as it turns out. But they've done some of the worst reporting imaginable. They're the ones who published the story about the blacklist of websites that were supposedly fronts for Russian propaganda that were really just mainstream left-wing or right-wing dissident sites that included the Judge Report and Make Capitalism and Truth Dig and all of that. The, the Washington Post sanctioned. They have a huge editor's note at the top of it now. They're the ones who reported that Russia had successfully hacked into the U.S. electric grid, which turned out to be utterly fabricated. So, you know, you can ask, well, what is the motive there? I don't know the motive. Was it just sloppiness? Was it recklessness? Was it ideological overzealousness? Was it a desire to please sources? All I know is that they benefit greatly from doing this because every time they publish a story like that, it gets tens of thousands of retweets and Facebook shares. The traffic goes through the roof. Those sites were, those articles that I identified were among the most well-trafficked sites on the Washington Post for the entire year. Um, there's no harm that, it happens when it turns out to be a fraud. They just run an editor's note that they just slap on. They don't publicize it. You know, re re tweets of retractions get one eightieth or one one hundredth of the tweets that the original article gets. No one's reputation suffers because it's perceived that it's for a good cause. So if you're Edward J. Epstein, you have nothing to lose by lying mm -hmm. and saying that Snowden is a Russian spy because you know that there's a lot of crazy people who are going to believe anything that you say when you accuse somebody of being a Russian spy. That's just the nature of our political culture now. 
You have a lot of ideologues who hate what Snowden did because they love the CIA or they love the NSA or the U.S. intelligence community and want to hate Snowden and want to believe whatever he says. And even as is the case here, when it turns out to be a total fraud, they have all the benefits of the book sales and the traffic that got generated and even their reputation. Their followers don't care. They even even if their followers are now convinced that these stories turned out to be false, they think they were doing it for a good cause, namely to harm the reputation of a person they regard as a traitor. So truth is a completely irrelevant metric when it comes to their calculus. They benefit in so many ways. And look, look what Rachel Maddow did when she insanely overhyped the story, led everyone on purpose to believe that she actually had Trump's tax returns, meaning all of his tax returns for the last 12 years that have been hidden, when she only had two pages from 2005 that revealed nothing except things that helped Trump. Yes, her reputation took a hit, and yes, she was mocked by Colbert and, and other people, but the ratings were through the roof, and she got a lot of attention, and her name recognition skyrocketed among people who didn't usually watch her. So the benefits she got for this act of journalistic recklessness were very extreme, and the harm was relatively small. And so the incentive scheme is someone that will encourage her and the Washington Post and lots of others, including Edward J. Epstein's of the world, to keep doing this because they continually get rewarded no matter how false their claims end up being proven. And we sh I should add uh, for the viewers that this Edward Epstein literally, uh, according to him, says he went down to Hong Kong and independently confirmed uh, that Snowden had not checked in till, till June 1st, which obviously is not true. Well, and also, and also it shows you the, 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 the sleaziness of how reporting in the United States is done because one of the ways that he accomplished this was he claimed to have an anonymous source who told him that they, they, the U.S. government, which has its spying eyes on everyone and everything, especially digital data, had searched and was unable to find any records, hotel records or credit card records, of where Snowden would be during that period in Hong Kong that he claimed was unaccounted for. And as it turns out, because we just published them today, the records from the hotel were in Edward Snowden's name. He purposely checked it in his own name exactly to make sure to create a record of where he was so nobody could question it. And he paid for the room in his own credit cards that the U.S. government quickly closed down once he was indicted. So I don't know if Edward J. Epstein's source lied to him when he... He said they couldn't find how the records was. I don't know if that be true. It was based on this anonymous claim. Was a blatant lie, and and you see that you can hold the evidence in your hand in the form of the credit card and hotel records that show you that it's a blatant lie. Not just that he wasn't there, but that the government was unable to find any of those records. And so this is why it's so important. Even if you want to believe what a journalist says when they tell you that some intelligence official whose identity they're concealing made a claim, you have to be skeptical of it. So often, the journalist gets manipulated, the journalist can be lying, the source can be mistaken, the source might have an agenda. You should never believe claims that are made by anonymous sources inside the government, absent documentary evidence that you can hold in your hand, or any other kind of tangible evidence to make you believe that the claims are actually true. And I wanted to ask you about uh, kind of hypocrisy and in inconsistencies, because let's look at this week, for example, uh, a Fox News commentator, uh, Judge Andrew DiPantano, out of thin air, uh, said he has sources that confirm uh, President Trump was wiretapped by the last president, CNN, The New York Times, all of the legacy media, uh, the corporate media, right, rightly, correctly uh, criticized that and covered that, and that was proven to be false. And now... Uh, that commentator has been indef indefinitely yanked off the air. However, I'm not really uh, that hopeful that your uh, really great exclusive breaking story is going to be on CNN tonight or, or all over the place. Maybe it's because they have a bias against uh, Edward Snowden. Can you talk about that inconsistency? Yeah, I mean, how often have we seen journalists disseminate wildly misleading information and pay no price and get no accountability of any kind. In the case of Fox and Napolitano, I'm actually, I find that to be an encouraging example. That was a case where a longtime employee of Fox, one of their stars who they've invested a lot of money in making recognizable to their audience, got caught 
engaging in journalistic recklessness, disseminated a really consequential story for which there was never any journalistic basis. And rather than just closing ranks or ignoring criticisms, which they easily could have done, have done many times in the past, Fox decided that it rose to the level where they were sufficiently embarrassed that they had to take him off the air, in part because other journalists at Fox, like Shepard Smith, were very vocal in condemning the story. When has that ever happened at MSNBC? I could show you so many times when Joanne Reed lied about stories over the last four years. I've, we've documented so many times, just during the election, she went on the air with one of her favorite guests, Malcolm Nance, and they were trying to smear Joel Stein's reputation for obvious reasons. They were worried that she would take away votes from Hillary Clinton, which was the purpose of MS, MS, MSNBC, was to make sure Hillary Clinton got the maximum number of votes. And in the course of doing this, they told their viewers that Jill Stein, in the course of trying to depict her as a Kremlin agent, had a show on RT. Jill Stein never had a show on RT. It was a total fabrication, complete fiction. I've yelled about it and screamed about it in my column and on Twitter. The media watchdog group FAIR has done the same. I know they're aware of it. It's impossible that they're not. So many people from MSNBC follow me on Twitter or follow FAIR. I've done everything possible to make sure they know. Zero correction, zero retraction, zero apology, let alone taking anybody off the air. Same with the Washington Post story. Same with all of the, the stories that have turned out to be utterly false about Russia and so many other things. And so, yes, it, it is a good thing that, that Judge Napolitano uh, uh, has indefinitely suspended and Fox should be commended for that and I just as you say um, when they end up deliberately or otherwise disseminating outright lies to the public through a desire to deceive or through journalistic recklessness and I should add the Washington Post also went with a reckless story saying Russia uh, took down the electric uh, grid uh, in Vermont and then instead of a retraction or a correction uh, basically tweaked a few things and moved on. So even in these outlets that are heralded as the example of, of journalistic ethos, th there's a lot of recklessness. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to lastly ask you, um, on, on Snowden, obviously, I think the debate on hero or traitor, uh, it's a fair debate. If people want to have that debate, I have my views, you have yours. Um, but it seems to me that you you have the central debate on that, but these journalists tried to find a quick and sleazy way to to find a twist or an angle in the story. Do you think that uh, in terms of what President Trump could possibly do, there was there was rumors that you know Russia was going to give Snowden as as a gift, which was you know kind of just gossip and BS. But how does this uh, does this revelation impact the Snowden story going forward, or you just think this uh, kind of ties up a very big loose end of disinformation. Interestingly, the, 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 the person who was most pushing this idea that Putin would give Snowden to Trump as some kind of a gift was Hillary Clinton's vocal CIA surrogate, Mike Morrell, who was President Obama's acting CIA chief. He actually wrote a column advocating this, trying to manipulate Trump into doing it by saying this would be a great way for you, President Trump, to patch up the acrimonious relationship you have with the intelligence community. If you could show them that you got Snowden's head that you can place on a stick outside the White House, they would actually love you. And you should trade trade Snowden with Putin for other favors. And the, pen, the, the Kremlin actually came out and said, first of all, it's, they mocked him. They said, for an intelligent ag agent, you don't know very much because two weeks ago, we just extended Snowden's residency permit for another three years. So rather than preparing to hand him over to the U.S., we actually just gave him residency rights for three, three more years. And then they said, beyond that, it's really repellent of you, Mike Morrell, to talk about trading human beings as though they're objects. That says a lot about your values and the way that you think. Now, obviously, a good amount of that was trolling. But I think that Putin is pretty invested in the idea that he wants to show that he abides by international law and human rights, and therefore is protecting Snowden from what he has said is persecution back in the United States that he would face, which he would. Also, 
over the years, there have been many Russian fugitives who have escaped to the U.S., and the Russians have demanded that they be extradited, and the U.S.'s position has always been, sorry, we would love to, but there's no extradition treaty, so there's no mechanism for us to give them back to you. So this was definitely a little bit of vengeance on the part of Russia to say, sorry, we don't have an extradition treaty with you. We can't hand over Snowden to you. There's no legal mechanism to do it. It still might happen. Um, you know, both Putin and, and the United States are um, very willing to trade. But I think that the crucial point is not so much the way that this was intended to smear Snowden as a Russian agent, although that was obviously the specific goal. It's the ease with which people can now be accused of being Russian agents and therefore traitors or disloyal, notwithstanding the complete lack of evidence to support those accusations. I mean, I can't tell you, you and I have discussed this before, how many times we've been accused of being Russian agents by virtue of the reporting that we've been doing and wanting evidence, and not just from random, random Twitter trolls, but Howard Dean, the former DNC chief, went on Twitter and said, I'd really love to know how much money, how much Russian money or Iranian money the Intercept is receiving. Joy Reid has called me an agent of the Russian Federation. Um, you know, Rachel Maddow did it to Jill Stein over and over. And I know you guys get it all the time, too, because you've been skeptics on, on the question of collusion and wanting to see evidence on hacking. So we've gotten this climate now. And obviously, The Washington Post laundered a blacklist of websites that you should avoid on the grounds that they're propaganda outlets for the Kremlin. So this is the outlet, the, the climate that has been created, which is one of the reasons why these false accusations are so easily laundered and why they likely won't be retracted where basically anyone can be accused of being a Russian spy or a Kremlin agent, no evidence is necessary. That is the climate that fostered what was done to Snowden and is now growing and being used for so many different uh, targets. And, and that's what I, why I think that the climate that we've allowed to fester has become so dangerous.